Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I'm here today with Ian Briggs. Hello. Hello everyone. <laughs> Can you tell the audience a little bit about sort of who you are, what you do? Um, my name is Ian Briggs, as we've just heard. Uh, I'm the design director and co-founder of BAC, um, the manufacturers, or the Liverpool-based manufacturers of Mono. Um, my background is in automotive design. Um, my brother's background was in automotive engineering, and back in 2009, we formed a company called BAC to design and build the car that some of you may know as Mono. Mm. Right, let's, let's sort of dive back a little bit. How, how did you get into all of this? Like, have you been sort of car nut from the beginning? One of my first ever memories, and I've said this a lot, so apologies to anyone who's heard this story before, but uh, uh, I was on my dad's shoulders. I was less than three because Neil wasn't born. Um, I didn't even have shoes on. My feet were tucked into the jacket of my dad, and he had his hood of his jacket around me the whole day in the uh, North Wales forest watching rally cars. Um, <laughs> nice. I remember um, he got me to go by telling me there was a, a bear in a book that my mum used to read to me. And my dad told me that bear lived in that woods. And he said, <laughs> half the time, you were looking over your shoulder saying, where's Teddy Tar, you know? Um, but, uh, but, but I started right, right from the very beginning. It was kind of, it was just one of the things, uh, my mum and my sister talking about horses around the dinner table and me, Neil, and dad talking about cars. So, um, without becoming too complicated in the story, I basically went on to study automotive design at Coventry. Um, and then I had a little diversion into some uh, boat design, some marine design, um, and ended up in 96 going to work as a freelancer for Mercedes in uh, Stuttgart, which is where, I've, which is where I now live. Um, and then Neil and I, Neil was working in Cologne for Ford as a car engineer, also freelance. Um, and then we were getting offered bigger and bigger projects. Um, so we started getting more and more people involved in the projects. Long story short, we were a design engineering uh, office for the big, the big car companies. Um, but in parallel, I was doing the German Karting Championship. Neil was doing, I think, Global GT Lights at the time, or Palmer Audi. Um, we both had nice cars, taking them on track on occasions. and. I just there was a car that that we wanted that that didn't really exist. I mean, if, if I can just just a little tiny bit of detail on that, I was racing for a guy called Frank Yulinski, and he used to race with Stefan Beloff, Jonathan Palmer, that area of Formula Two, mm. and he nearly got to Formula One. Uh, he ended up being a works Porsche driver, raced at Le Mans and all the rest of it, um, and and he'd drive the carts as well, and he was still quick. And there was four of us in the team, and we were all within a tenth of each other all the time. So. I said to him one night, we were driving to Le Mans for the, for the 24 hour karting event there. And I said, you know, you know how quick I am, you know what I can do, could I, could I do what you do? And, uh, and he said, yeah, in formula cars, you definitely could. Um, and I said, why formula cars? He said, well, when you get into sports cars and GT cars and God forbid, NASCARs, you know, touring cars, whatever, they take a certain style and there's no way of knowing if, you, if, if your driving style fits to that, you yeah. know, at, at any given moment. But, but guys who are quick in carts are quick in formula cars. Um, and he explained to me a few bits and bobs. And, and that, that was the point when I started kind of dreaming about a formula car. Uh, that mm. Instead of track day in my Lotus, it was an Exige Cup at the time. Instead of track day in that and taking the passenger seat out and putting lighter bits and bobs on it, <laughs> that wouldn't it be great to have something that was as focused on driving as, as my skis are on skiing, as my mountain bike is on, on cycling? Um, so anyway, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's how the idea came along. But yes, um, back to, um, yeah, so we started, so we had the design engineering business. Um, and yeah, the idea was, okay, we want to make this car. Worst case, it's a good acquisition project. We'll show our clients what we can do if we're given a bit more freedom. Um, and then so, you know, we put our designer on it and an engineer on it. And then it just kind of snowballed until... Um, until we launched the car in 2011 and then and then you know there's a lot of interest and stuff and so we very quickly you know ended all the projects we were we were currently working on and ever since then it's been um, it's been the focus uh BAC yeah when um let's let's wind a little bit back your sort of fascination and going down the design route and then Neil going down the engineering route was that you just 
diverge in terms of things you like or you were like there's some sort of long-term strategy you're like well maybe we can link, link back up in the future no that i mean i don't think i don't think we ever thought that far ahead no i i enjoyed i enjoyed the design side um i did a level design um mm. i enjoyed making things but i also enjoyed sketching i enjoyed kind of the conceptual side of product design of industrial yeah. design um being open and honest i didn't think i could get into automotive I mean, people mix up the words of design engineering all the time, I feel. Um, but back then, there was no internet. There was no way of knowing where you could study. So, for example, we had a careers tutor. Um, and I went to him. I said, I'm really into cars, and I really like making stuff and creating. Well, he just immediately thought, OK, the lad wants to do automotive engineering. He said, you, you need good grades in your maths and physics, which was never my strong point. So I yeah. kind of gave up on, on it at that point. And I actually started my first year at university was to study architecture because I thought there's, there's a place where I can conceptually design spaces and the way you move through spaces, how things look. You know, I enjoyed all that side of things. Mm. And then by accident, I saw an uh, article in Car Magazine about Coventry. And I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. You know, there was no <laughs> other way. Of, you, you know, nowadays, you just go on Google and you'd find it in 10 seconds. But I like, that's what I want to do. And I was at Leicester studying architecture. And... Um, I lived with a German guy who had a car, which was, you know, like being royalty. Uh, so he's like, I'll take you. You know, I'd love to see Coventry yeah. anyway. So we went over and visited the school. I never forget, I got in the lift to go up to the studio and it was an Otis lift. And someone had scratched the Otis logo into Lotus. <laughs> and I could smell the clay from the clay studios and the doors open. It's just car renderings all over the wall. I'm like, this is it. I'm getting goosebumps now. Um, <laughs> so I kind of, it was a bit of a zigzag path into design for me. But Neil was good at maths and physics, and, and he naturally went into, he naturally went into, I think he studied mechanical engineering at Manchester, and then he did automotive engineering masters at Loughborough. So, no, there was no design at the beginning. There was no, no, no design to, to, to create the two components we need to create a car company. That was a fortunate yeah. coincidence, I would say. And at, at Coventry, because Coventry still does automotive design yes. and stuff like that now, it's one of the leading places, I believe. Yes. Um, but... What sort of thing are you studying? Like when you someone says, oh, "Okay, you're going to do, yeah, automotive design." Like, what sort of things do you come together and study? Well, well, automotive design is a kind of a subset of industrial design. Okay. And the thing that differentiates industrial design from most other kind of disciplines is it's not possible to teach you how to design everything from a kettle, a Walkman, <laughs> an iPod, <laughs> a chair. You, know, you can't tell someone how to do that. So what you actually learn is a process. You learn the, the design process where you establish your brief and you have a research phase and you have a brainstorming phase where, you, where you're going out and out and out in your thinking and then you start evaluating your, your brainstormed ideas against your brief and then you can't start coming back in towards your, your, your solution. So most of what you study there uh, is about reinforcing that process. You know, you get a, a piece of paper, a drawing pin and some glue and an egg and they're going <laughs> to drop it off the fourth floor of the building and we're going to see who can make his egg survive. You know, things like that. They're not, yeah. they're not saying, you know, this is how a wheel art should look. Um, I think in other industries, you know, where, where you've got architect in architecture, naval architecture, things like that, they're a little bit more intertwined. I think what's good about car design and car engineering is there's a really clear definition uh, between the two, and it allows um, it allows a designer to you know to focus on the design engine on the on the engineering. But anyway, um, they're the types of things you do. And we did aerodynamics projects as well. Of course, you need to learn all those things. There, there is an engineering content to the course because you know you, you can't just be creating automotive sculpture all the time. It's it's got to work, um, yeah. and that's something. You know, it's always been important to me. Anyway, I don't want to create something that looks pretty but drives terrible. Um, yeah. You know, something that's, yeah, doesn't fit people in it and, and is unstable at speed. I mean, that's, I mean, anyone could do that. That's, that's something you'd do for a movie, but that's not yeah. something you'd do for the real world. And so, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's what you, that's what you, that's what you do in there. And so it was a, it was industrial design specializing in transportation, actually. Okay. And one of the, one of the projects I did quite near the end, um, I'd started water skiing as a hobby and mm -hmm. I, and I just realized how difficult and ill-conceived 
boats are for water skiing you know everyone's <laughs> panicking that the engine's still in gear when you're in the water it's going to catch the rope in the prop or catch you in the prop and then getting in and out and they're pulling you by your wetsuit and you flop onto the seat now the seat's wet and the girls are molding and it's, it's just a disaster i'm right with it so i did a project um with this f for a boat where the, the rear was completely open it's like a surfboard when the boat was stationary there was water in the back you know you yeah, okay, six yeah. inches of water and you could as you put your weight on it it got even lower and um, and that got me kind of a little bit interested in the boating side. I also did a placement at, um, at Fairline in my third year, which was also, uh, uh, that was actually interior design. Um, that came about accidentally as well. And too complicated a story, but long story short, I ended up uh, doing a design competition for my final year, which was actually a, a concept for a yacht, for a catamaran. And mm. um, that was my first job. I won that competition and got, and got a job for two years. That's why I ended up doing um, yacht design over in America. And the reason, the point of the story is, if you know how to design, you not can't be an expert in everything, but you can certainly yeah. turn your hand to that thing, you know, designing a piece of furniture, designing interior space, designing exterior space. And you'll get engineers and experts and people, you know, understand statics and all this kind of stuff as you need them. And that's, that's, that's the industrial design process that you're taught rather than how to design an actual mm. thing. Is it quite good? having a sort of not being established in an industry i'm not saying you're not established but like let's say you're when you're we starting out or sure. whatever the you you're a designer and you you're like initially you're looking at this and you're like oh let's i've got this idea for a boat or something not being involved in the boating industry at yes. the time that you start designing a boat is that presumably that's quite a good thing from your initial outlook is in you have no preconceptions of what a boat should be like I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm a, a little anecdote. We did a, we did a, I, I finally got to design that speedboat, that, that ski boat. Mm. Um, and at the time, uh, early nineties, this was, um, we wanted to use a water jet, like a, like a jet ski. So there's no danger to the people in the water, yeah. no chance of tying up the rope, uh, tangling up the rope and stuff. So, I mean, again, way before the internet. Um, so I went out and bought all these boats on jet boats and, and things started looking in the adverts for jets in the back started contacting them we're designing a boat interested in using your jet can we talk to you about you know how we should design the hull and what would be ideal and they were like they, they couldn't they were flabbergasted they said no one's ever done this before and to me it seems the most obvious thing to do if you're going to design a boat that's powered by a water jet then you'd speak to those people and say you know how should the area ahead of the jet be formed and how should it look and what angle do you want all this that seemed obvious to me um, and, and we, we also, I wanted, because we wanted to get in and out of the boat really easy, the engine was small. It was actually <clears throat> a Mazda, uh, rotary engine. It was the RX seven engine of the time <laughs> really? and Mazda yeah. North America had been doing a project to marinize it. So they took the turbo off and put a supercharger on it. It was the size of a beer barrel. It was fantastic. It allowed, it gave you so much interior space. You know, the, the V eights in ski boats just dominate the interior of a boat. Yeah. Um, and it was under a seat. You didn't even know it was there. Um, and Boston Whaler got the engine and a 17 foot boat and did some trials for a few weeks. And then we got the actual engine they had sent down to us and we put it in our 17 foot boat. And we went seven knots faster, um, <laughs> not because we're great designers or anything, just because we'd never done it before. And we'd done it exactly how the jet designers had told us to do it, exactly yeah. how they'd, they'd, they'd recommended. Um, and so I do think it's good to come with, it, with, with a fresh eyes. You know, they say you can't see the wood for the trees. Sometimes when you're in mm -hmm. an industry, um, the way of normally doing things um, is fine, and, and um, but but if you want to discover new things and, and move forward, I do think it's good to have a fresh fresh eyes approach. And and to be honest, that's something I always try to instill in the guys at the factory, um, in my department in design. I try the older guy, um, who's my age. You know, we know what's possible to make and what isn't possible to make. And I try yeah. to insulate the the younger guys from that <laughs> so that they can keep an open mind. I don't want them. Ah, oh, that'd be important. That'd be a nightmare to make. That she's like, no, let's decide what we want, and we'll see if we can find a way uh, to make it work or get close to that with a way that's that, that makes it work. Yeah, and presumably over the years you've been doing this, the things that you can now make has massively changed because of technology. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I would say up until up until 3D printing, not much had changed really. I mean, um, people were getting better at molding carbon parts, so you could mold more complicated parts than you could in the early days. But it's still essentially mm. um, a mold with a with a tooling direction, and and your mold has to have as many pieces as you have tooling directions in your part. 
but the moment 3D printing came along, um, everything changed. That's uh, unbelievable. I, I, I'll be being open and honest. I was a little bit slow in understanding the capability of 3D printing because it was often referred to as rapid prototyping in the early days. And yeah. we don't make that many prototypes. I mean, we'll, you know, when we launch the car and the car's ready and we're building it, there's not a great deal of requirement for, for rapid prototypes. Um, and so I didn't really understand the, 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 the capability. But when, it's, when it becomes additive manufacturing and you start to think about what you can do, I mean, everything we do is about either removing material or creating that material into a mold that already has that form. Whereas with 3D printing, you can create an outside shape and the inside shape can be any, anything you want. And so it, it, it even takes time to understand how you can get the most out of it. But the mirror arms on Mono R, for example, they're hollow with a honeycomb inside. So they're lovely and smooth and aerodynamic on the outside. They don't need ribs. They don't need reinforcements or anything like that because they're all inside. Um, you know, when, when I mean, print, 3D metal printing is, is still too expensive for most uh, applications. But now they can. You, know, you could print a wishbone, for example, um, with a with a with an internal structure, so you don't need all that reinforcement, and you don't need yeah. all those uh, getting fatter to the end where the connections are and stuff like that. So, no, it, th th that's the um, that's the most exciting area for me: additive manufacturing. And for the people that haven't don't know what that is, so additive manufacturing. What is additive manufacturing? I mean, the simple way to think of it. Um, and there's, there's versions and variants on this, but just think about starting with a piece of paper and your ink, inkjet printer puts the shape of the thing you wanna make down as a layer of ink. Then the piece of paper drops a thousandth of a millimeter and it puts another layer on top and then it drops down a thousandth of a millimeter and it does that. It just keeps doing that, building up these layers. Um, you need support structure because obviously if, if the thing you're making let's say you were trying to make a upside down pyramid you know there's got to be somewhere for the next for the first layer yeah. to sit or the second layer to sit on the first so you'll end up with creating support structures but the software that does all that for you um and depending on the the direction in which you want um to carry loads and depending on which part of the part is important for uh, uh aesthetic reasons whether you know for a good finish you can orientate the part in different directions, but it's essentially just take, like taking lots and lots of slices of any object. You know, you could take a mouse, mm. slice it into a thousand slices and just imagine printing them slice by slice. You can do it with plastic. We do it now with a carbon fiber reinforced plastic uh, and you can do it with metal. Um, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. As you can imagine, the layers have to bond to the layer before. So yeah. they're getting better and better at doing that. Now you have heated chambers that keep the metal almost molten, metal or, um, or plastic almost molten until the next layer goes on. So you okay. get really good interlayer strength. Early parts were a bit brittle um, yeah. across the layers, but along the layers they were strong. That's still uh, the case for, to a certain extent, but it's, uh, it's, it's getting better and better. And, and doing this process, like, have you basically kind of had to almost throw out, you, like we were saying before, like throw out the way of doing it because you're like, well, I can make something like I'm, I'm, this is a little case here, but it's like if you open it up, there's all sorts of crazy stuff inside. Now, in a conventional way of manufacturing something, impossible. Well, obviously not impossible in that because it's two bits put together. But you know what I mean? <laughs> I like you mean. can make a solid structure that has an, a crazy amount of stuff inside that you yeah. cannot see, cannot access can't do anything well it's like it's like any te new technology uh, i don't know if you recall the first times we the first time we had carbon fiber bicycles you know they were really just carbon mm. fiber tubes joined at the end ends just like they were joining metal tubes yeah um it was a new technology there was some weight savings doing it that way but it wasn't really taking full advantage of the material you know mm. and now if you look at a carbon fiber bike they're, they're monocoques um and and there's complete freedom of shape so you can make aerodynamic shapes you can make shapes with the depth you need in certain areas to give you more stiffness you know they can really use the material and it's moldable uh, unlike you know unlike a steel tube or unlike uh, sheet steel so you can really you know over time we've learned how to use that material to its best and i think that's that that's a process we have to go through with additive manufacturing as well, because the first, your first thoughts are you create the shape you want, and then you look at where the loads are and you add material 
uh, to, to, to create that stiffness. And yeah. what you end up with then is a, sh is a shape where you say, okay, that's what I'm going to end up with. So I'm going to start with a block and I'm going to machine it all away out of solid and I'm going to end up with it or I'm going to cast it. Um, whereas with additive manufacturing, like you say, you can, end, you can make any shape you want and then put the structure inside that you need. You know, you can have, I mean, there's software that does that automatically for you. You can have anything from a 5% to a 95% honeycomb inside and you can pick the different patterns that give you just stability or strength in a certain direction. And even after you've done that, then you can then add additional ribs as well. So uh, sky's the limit, really. It's, uh, it's a super exciting technology and it's definitely the way we'll be making more and more parts in the future. Yeah, looking at it, because there's, um, what's that company? Zinger. Yeah, it's like Singer, Zinger in yes. the States. I know they do a lot. Absolutely. Um, and, and, I think, uh, and I think it's affordable on a, on a one or $2 million car. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I said earlier, it's not Apple, it, uh, and in Formula One uh, and on, in aerospace. Um, it's, not, it, it, it's not in metal. It's, it's difficult at the moment, but it will, it will happen. It, you know, the carbon fiber wasn't affordable in the early days, and, and now yeah. it is. Um, we're printing in plastic uh, with 44 parts. We've, we're printing structural parts as well. We've got the intake uh, on the Mono R, you know, the big, the big air intake that's yeah. the Marmite air intake uh, that you love it or hate it. Um, that's only supported by the four uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic runners, which are 3D printed. Um, mm. so, so you can do good stuff right now, and they're bolted directly to the engine. Um, they see all the same environment that the engine sees, the engine temperatures and everything. Um, so we've come a long way already. Yeah, and then, because along with this, you have the sort of iterative design side of it, you know, running it through a computer and to it, it forming the sort of perfect shape. Do, on some level, do you see that as like taking away from, you're like, well, I want to design it. And then the computer's like, but this is the perfect way. How do those blend? Um, I mean, I, I must admit, um, I mean, I suppose ultimately if you go far enough in the future, you know, 100 or 200 or 1,000 years or whatever, then, then, then maybe computers can be creative. I mean, they certainly can to a certain extent now. Um, I mean, generative, I don't, I don't, are you familiar with generative design, Sam? A little bit. So, yeah, so for, for people not so familiar, it, you know, historically what you would have done, let's say, you're making a bracket, you know, it bolts to a, to a surface and it's supporting something. So, you know, you, you design that bracket and you decide what material it's going to be. You'd put it through an FEM analysis and it'd show you where the areas of highest stress are and you'd add some material there and the areas with less stress, you'd take some away. And you'd go through that process three or four times, let's say, until you got to something that you'd consider was fairly optimized, all the none of the material's been overstressed and it's all similar color in the display to show you, okay, it's all carrying a similar amount of load. Well, generative design can do that thousands of times. Um, and pop out a solution and then do it again and pop out a solution. You can have a hundred solutions. They're still engineering solutions to a problem that you set. Um, yeah. And that's the difference. You know, if, 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 if you and I are brainstorming a new product, um, you know, single seater off-roader to do yeah. the Dakar, um, that's the creative process. That's the bit I like. That's the bit about yeah. imagining this, imagining that, imagine how we're going to do these different things. And then we could then have, ultimately we'd have a problem we needed to solve. You know, how do we carry the spare wheel in the most, you know, material and weight efficient way? I yeah. want to put it here. I've decided that for aerodynamics. I want to do it in this way. I've picked this wheel because of this and this reason. So we've made lots of creative um, decisions that are balancing the whole concept of the vehicle and then said, okay, design me a, make me a bracket that connects to these three points and supports this weight. Then it can come up with some really bizarre stuff. And they look, you know, they look, they look like trees, which isn't yeah. surprising. I mean, nature, nature's <laughs> generative, evolution's generative design ultimately. So, uh, so, so whilst I, I'm open to anything being possible in the future, uh, I think it'll be a long time before the really creative part uh, yeah. creative, creative, you creative are. people will be replaced. Hopefully. Yeah, like like you said, <laughs> at the moment you're you're picking the key bits. You're like it needs to be able to withstand this load in this area and blah blah blah, and then it just, it fills in the gaps. Yeah, I mean is, it doesn't it 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 hasn't decided which wheel entire package it thinks the most sensible yeah. to, to compete at the deck. It hasn't decided the best place to carry them. It hasn't decided the balance between 
make it make it best for the dynamics of the vehicle to have the weight there but then make it possible for the driver and co-driver to get it out and get it on the wheel in it uh, get it on the on the car in a in a reasonable amount of time there's lots and lots of things to consider yeah. when you design a vehicle obviously uh, and it's not des it's not making all those decisions for you it's just saying there's here's a hundred different ways of a bracket supporting that weight for example yeah. when you first started thinking about making a single seater and a single seater road car that that in itself, because there are there any other single seater road cars? Not that I'm, I'm aware of. I'm trying to think. No, yeah, so you're starting a, a basically effectively like a new category. Was that a bit of a leap into the unknown as well? Because you're like, no one's done this. It, it How do we? Are people going to want it? How do you, <laughs> I mean, that, that's anyway. always a question. I mean, that's that's the, the, there were some sleepless nights about that, of course. Um, the fact the fact that we've gone into it kind of step by step in the worst case we'll build a handful and uh, yeah. we'll have the car we want and it'll be a you know an acquisition project for our design engineering business allowed mm. us to le worry less about that whole you know you're going to sell enough um, that was obvious we were going to sell enough once we launched it but uh, if we just take a step back it goes back to the d discussion we had earlier about um, I mean, we were in the industry, but it's about just having a fresh eyes approach. Um, yeah, if you if you if you look at if you look at the time when if you go back to the time when the horse was transport, it was it, it pulled plows through fields, it pulled you know carriages along roads, it you know it, it was the truck, it was the engine of, of all of our yeah. transport needs. When the car replaced it, the horse didn't stop existing it just became a luxury product so you could you know fast forward 50 years in the future you know a horse that's really perfect at show jumping might have been frowned upon 100 years earlier because you say well i can't yeah. plow a field with that you know it's not strong enough it's not this it's not that yeah but it's great at jumping you know so it seemed obvious to me that as the whole world of uh, the whole automotive world you know ev everyone's got the right car for the right job I and mean, if i want to go on holiday with the family you know i want a big estate car or if i want to yeah you know or a range rover or something if i want to go away for the weekend um with the wife you know maybe a convertible mid-engine sports car you know put the roof down go and stay in a nice hotel I mean, yeah. there's, there's something for everybody but what there wasn't was something that was as focused as well, that's a formula car, actually, because even they are the only, most all cars have a legacy of being transport, ultimately. Yeah. Um, and that's not a criticism. That's what they are. And that's what a car is for me 99% of the time. Um, I think, you know, I have lots of analogies how I yeah, explain the, the what the project, what the what the product's meant to be. But imagine if you grew up in, a, let's say you grew up in Vietnam and all you'd ever seen as a bicycle was a rickshaw wheel at the front, yeah. two wheels at the back, two seats at the back, there's a bit of a half roof, big basket on the front where you can put stuff in it. You've never seen any other kind of a bicycle. That's all you've ever seen. There's some luxurious ones with nice leather that you can completely close so you keep warm. And there's some that are made out of lighter materials and with special gears and stuff, so they're a little bit faster. But that's, that's, that was a bike to you. And then mm. someone comes along with a five kilogram Tour de France time trial bike. <laughs> and you look at it and scratch it. And where do I, there's nowhere for anyone else to sit. There's, where do I put anything? It's like, no, it's not, it's not about transport anymore. <laughs> this is now a piece of equipment to, that's totally focused on that thing. So we, we set out to, to create something that had no other function than be as good as it can be at driving. You know, we, 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 make, we design skis to be the best skis they can be because we just go up on a lift and we slide back down the hill. We don't do anything else with yeah. those skis. No one says, where do I put the luggage? Where do I put the wife <laughs> or my mate? So, or sometimes I like to have a mate with me. Well, he should buy a pair of skis as well and he should ski next year. <laughs> and when people say, isn't it a bit lonely? He says, I'm, not, I'm never lonely when I'm skiing. I'm with all my <laughs> friends and we all go skiing. You know, um, yeah. so I went a bit off piece there, pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, but no, so it wasn't scary at all. It just seemed the logical thing to do. And, yeah. and I'm convinced, sorry to go on so much, um, I'm convinced that if in a period of time, and whether that's five or 10 or 15 years time, or however long it is, when transport to all of us is an autonomous car that we call up with an app, we sit facing each other and all watch a movie while it takes us home. If that's transport, and I'm convinced that will be transport, in the same way we do it, we travel in a train, the same way we travel yeah. in a plane, if you see a car with a steering wheel, you're going to know that guy 
just like the person going horse riding or the person who goes show jumping. That guy wants to drive. And now that thing doesn't have to fulfill any other transport function other than be really good at driving. And I mm. think mono in that respect will be an easier product to understand in the future, or it will become easier to understand as time goes on than it, than it, than it was on day one, which was 10 years ago, incidentally. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because like, if you look at cars, most most cars, even sports cars, they're sort of compromised in a sense because people are like, oh, I want to be able to put luggage in. So they're fulfilling a certain task, but most, let's say, supercars and sports cars, if you're not doing on, on a road trip or something, you don't need luggage, you basically don't need anything other than maybe a little bit of space. Most of the time, you might only be in as one person, in which case, like your comparison, well, it is a single seater. Once you've driven something that is single seat and you drive something that's two seats, you're like, oh, but the weight's all like, you're constantly trying to balance the car for having the driver on one side and exactly. the stuff on the other side. And anyone, anyone that's ever driven anywhere, you're either on the right hand side or the left and you're not quite sure where that other front side is because it's a bit far away and you can't see it and all of that. And then... Yeah, you get in something that is a single seater. So I, I came and drove your mono at Spa a while ago and ignoring anything about the drive experience, about whether it was, you know, light or whatever, all that stuff, just going down the road in the middle in a small single seater thing was completely different to anything else. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our brains do very well at cancelling out the fact that we're sitting off to one side until mm. we go to another country and sit on the opposite side and then we realize how awkward that actually is you know we forget that when you go around a right hand corner in england you know the car lifts you up and when you go around a left hand car the car you sink down we cancel all that out until the opposite happens and then it all feels very alien until yeah. your brain readjusts so even just even just that and, and the point you make is a good one. I mean, it's not against any of those cars. Those cars are designed to do a different thing. That's why I say back to the rickshaw. I mean, you know, you can make it more luxurious and you can make it more sporty, but it's still transport made more sporty. And if people, yeah. you know, I mean, I, when, when would it have been? It would have been mid 90s. Uh, I, got, I got my first Lotus was the Elise in 97. And I made a decision then between the Sport Spider, if you remember that car, and the Lotus mm. Elise. The Sport Spider at the time had no windscreen, it had doors, no heater, no roof. But for me at that time, it was going to be my second car. I had another car to go to work. And I was going to not only imagine going to my, with my friends to Le Mans to watch the race, but I'd go away for a weekend with the girlfriend. I'd want to you know, drive into town and go for a, yeah. go for a nice meal and cruise home in the evening. It, it had to do other things. And so I chose against the really focused thing I wasn't, I wasn't at a point in my life where I, where I could afford to have both, which is what I yeah. would have liked to have had. But even the focus thing back then was still a two-seater, so it was, it was still had a nod to the transport function. And yeah. yet we don't expect that of our time trial bike. We don't expect that of our canoe or of our parachute or no. someone's going to send me a picture of a two-seat canoe now. But, <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? All, yeah. all, anyone who enjoys a sport has a piece of equipment which is completely focused on being the best piece of equipment it can for that sport. And yeah. so if we could stop thinking of the of mono or and vehicles like it as a car, I mean, no, no one criti no, criticism is the wrong word, but no one wonders what you're supposed to do with a Ducati. And yet there's thousands <laughs> of guys get up on a Sunday morning, and take their Ducati, their Superbike, whatever brand it is, MV Augusta, and go and meet their friends at a cafe out on the moors and have a blast for a couple of hours and then go home and, and do the family thing with the wife and kids. It's, it's not that strange in the bike world. Because most mm. people accept that there's a group of people who ride bikes just for the sake of riding a bike. Um, so think of mono as a four-wheel superbike if it makes it easier to understand, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes much more sense. Because I think a lot of people look at it and go, but it's a car and I can't yep. put any luggage in it. Absolutely. Like, okay, but it's, it's more like a motorbike in the sense <laughs> of how you might use it or yeah. you can use it however you like. But in purity of purpose, I guess. Yeah, because yeah. people like to find a box to put something in. They, they, they struggle to find, a, you know, to create a new category, um, yeah. which, which, it, which it is in the automotive world, I believe. Yeah, and then you go to your track day. Um, we were at, you guys were there. I was at the supercar driver thing at, at Donington. And there's all sorts of incredibly fast road cars 
Um, and then there were some race cars and stuff like that. But, you know, you've got your whatever, a Chiron or a McLaren 765LT or all of this sort of stuff. And anyone that's done a lot of track driving knows that those cars are quite fast, but they're not as fast as a race car. And then, <laughs> and then at the same time, you're living in this sort of slightly different world of it is a road car, but it, you go, oh, it's only got 340 horsepower or whatever. And I was like, oh, it's only got 340 horsepower. And then it comes around you, around the outside. <laughs> it's physics. It, it's physics. It's weight, isn't it? You know, it's um, we were at Bilsterberg a few years ago <clears throat> with Ollie Webb. And um, one of the guys who was involved with Tilka in the original track design, we sent him out and uh, we went onto this, like a, there's like a walkway over the track and the walkway is just before a hairpin that goes around the clubhouse. And um, the guy said to me, he said, um, yeah, uh, I said, let him, let him get, let, let him get his eye in. He'd never been there and we'll see what kind of times he can do. And he said, oh yeah, the, the quick guys, the quick guys are breaking just as they come under the, under the gantry, under the bridge. I'm like, okay, so Ollie comes around first lap changes into sixth as he goes underneath us and the guy <laughs> literally went he thought he was going off he was convinced yeah. he was going off and all he stayed on the gas for a good one or two seconds and dung, 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 around the corner he looked at me i said it's it's physics it's weight you know you, <laughs> you've got to stop one and a half ton or half a ton it's you can't i mean everyone quotes chapman but he was a genius and you know you add power you're quicker on the straights you add lightness you're quicker everywhere yeah the I have a standout moment and uh, I think it was one of the first times I passengered in a Radical. So I have an SR3 and it, yep. I, whenever you take, it's the same, same if well, I say the same thing in a morning, you can't do it in a morning. But the, if you take someone out in a car like that, that light, and, to, and someone's not been in a car that light, and then this has got a bit of an aero element as well. Yes. They're there going, they've seen every single car, just like you said, they've slammed on the brakes at whatever it is, the 100 meter mark. And you just keep going and you just keep going and you just keep going. And they're like stamping through the floor. They're like, stop, stop, stop. And then you just like lift and yeah. go around the corner. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, I've got, uh, one of my, my, actually my dentist, uh, he was a good friend first and became my dentist afterwards, but, and a mono owner. He, um, he used to uh, have a GT3 RS and he goes to Hockenheim a lot. Mm. And the Parabolica there, big long, you're doing 250, something like that. Um, what's that one? 150, 155 mile an hour yeah. through there. And, and it's quite ripply, the braking area from the Formula One cars. And um, he knew where he braked in the GT3 RS and he said, I'm, 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 I'm literally counting to two before I hit the brakes. Um, <laughs> It, it's 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 a massive difference, and I think the other thing, uh, you know, the, when, when on Top Gear when Clarkson compared it, I thought that was really good. You know, he had the two hundred eight Peugeot two hundred eight going down the corner at something like eighty nine miles an hour, yeah. and then a, an M three was only ninety one, and a GTR yeah. was like ninety two or something. It was it was tiny little differences, and then Mono went through one hundred and four. Um, it, it's it is it's it's physics and. Um, so it's not single seat for the sake of the being unique or anything like that. It's just what it gives you. And, and even your radical, and it's nothing against the radical, but if, if, if with the same design philosophy, when they designed that, if they said yeah. this chassis only needs enough space for one person, it would be a little bit lighter. It would have a slightly smaller frontal area and it would go a little bit quicker, you know, but, yeah. but, but they accept that compromise cause it's very sports car inspired, very kind of little mini Le Mans car. Um, and there are people which I fully accept enjoy giving passenger rides and enjoy letting someone else have the experience which is absolutely fine yeah 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 but if if that car had a seat in the middle rather than on one side the the purity of design could be a bit better for its purpose and yeah it would be quicker yeah like, within the same you know exactly within all the whatnot. same parameters exactly it actually cost a little bit less as well when um <laughs> be less metal in when it, you're it? designing or well okay so we got mono and then we've we've now got, I don't know which came first. Did Mono R come before the new Mono? Yeah, I mean, the original Mono was the 2.3 litre normal aspirated, then the 2.5, then we did a slightly wider cockpit version. Um, the chassis didn't get any wider, the frontal area didn't increase, just created a bit more efficiently the, the space. So that was what we was originally Mono. Then we've done a Mono R, which happened to coincide with the point when we went to the new generation. So 
all the new componentry and all the new bodywork and all that kind of thing. So Mono R did come first, and the car that we now call Mono moving forward will be the turbo car, which is essentially aimed at meeting emissions in mainland Europe. It's essentially uh, a Mono R with with a turbo engine and some of the exotic materials and some of the exotic bits, you know, despect to make it um, a bit more affordable. What were some of the fun sort of design and interesting changes from Mono to Mono R, which is then going to be carried over? I, um, one of the things, um, one of the one of the big things was obviously uh, lightweight cars get the performance um, from being lightweight, but lightweight doesn't really help you at 140 miles an hour. Yeah, there's not many things accelerating fast enough that the weight is a significant factor. It's really the the, the wind at that speed. Yeah. So the, from, from, from my point of view on the design side, there was a big focus on, on how can we make it just more slippy. Um, and the easiest way to start doing that is to reduce the frontal area. Anytime you see drag coefficients quoted, they're utterly meaningless <laughs> until you multiply it by the frontal area. You know, yeah. you, could, you could have the slippiest teardrop in the world, but if it's the size of a house, it's going to be difficult to push it through the air, you know? So yeah. it, those two factors. Um, and so what we did was... If you can imagine, you know, there's some things that you have to have. You've got to have a driver and you've got to have wheels. Yeah. So imagine that person just sitting in front of you. You sit him as low as you can. And, and you know, Formula One have experimented with sitting drivers lower and lower and lower. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about the, 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 um, the angle of your body. And they found um, that if you get beyond about 45 degrees, you start to struggle to get to breathe properly. Mm. And so that's where Formula One's en ended up. You end up with 45 degrees. So you've got this driver sitting as reclined as he can, and now I've got a circumference of him. I've got to move him through the air. And one thing I really like about um, the single seat layout is it allows you then to put the fuel tank, the engine, and the gearbox are all behind that outline. So I've added nothing to my frontal area. If it was a transverse mm. engine, I would have added frontal area, but I haven't. Um, now, what can we put, you know, under the driver and in front of him again without reducing, without increasing any frontal area? And there was a bit of an aha moment, and that's why uh, Mono R has the central main beam lights, because okay. they, you know, your lighting package does take up some frontal area. If we can hide that in a in a place where we need it anyway, within the circumference of the driver, yeah. then. Uh, then we're, then we're ahead. Um, the original mono had the lights below the rear wing. Um, we've moved them outboard to be behind the, the, the rear wheels. So essentially what we've tried to do is put everything in front of the wheels or behind the wheels and everything yeah. within the circumference of the driver, forwards or yeah. behind him. So make the car slippier. Um, and if you see the car, you know, what we call them the, the upper body or the main body. That's the, that's the thing that's the color of the car. You know, if someone sees a white mono, it's everything that's white. Yeah. Lift that off. What you actually see is something that's very narrow by your feet. Starts, it actually starts the width of two headlamps. Gets wider past your feet, past your hips. It's the widest by your shoulders. I also like the four-cylinder four engine for that respect. It's, it's lovely and narrow. You know, it's not sticking yeah. out at all. Um, and then it gets narrow and narrow, and it ends up with the crash structure at the rear, which is the width of the fog light. So it's this lovely, lovely aerodynamic shape all the way through the car. And there's a purity to that. And as a designer, you know, I like that as well. So, so that mm. was one of the big focuses. I uh, really enjoyed, you know, optimizing that. And then um, that led to the wishbones becoming more aerodynamic as well, because you've got to have that, you've got to connect the wheels to the car. And that's what I also love about creating this type of project, because I don't, a product, I, we don't need, you know, I, I, I've done projects with Porsche in the past and i have massive admiration for that company and for those guys because you know when you redesign the 911 it could be anyone from a mum taking her daughter to school yeah. to a lad doing a lap of the nurburgring you know and how and how do you make all the decisions that affect you in one direction or the other um we don't have that we don't have that it's absolutely clear let's make it slippier let's make it lighter let's get the weight lower if we're going to save weight, let's save it where it's the most important place to save it. And once we've done that, let's get it as low as we can. And once we've done that, let's move it towards the driver. Yeah. You know, we've, we've moved the battery. The battery used to be in the nose, on the floor, lay flat. Now it's lay flat under the driver's knees where the fire extinguisher is. Fuel tank's directly behind the driver. The C of G doesn't change uh, from full to empty tank. Um, it's 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 wonderful to just to design for that such a pure thing and to have such a yeah. such an easy checklist an easy brief by which you check off your ideas does this get us closer to what we're trying to achieve yeah 
Yeah, yeah, you don't have... Yeah, that is impressive when you look at someone, yeah, like Porsche. Yeah. Who've who got this this crazy remit. Even you then start ending up with cars that seem really confused as well, though. Like, yes. let's say you might have a Cayenne Turbo S GT whatever, and they're like, it'll do the fastest <laughs> Nürburgring lap time for a car, like, you know, an SUV. And it's like, yeah. who cares? Yeah. I, I, I don't actually know who cares. And, and, <laughs> and, and then Manti Racing go and tune it. It's like, yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why I say, you know, right tool for the job. Our customers have all these various cars. But, you know, my dream garage, it, you know, it'd have the family, it'd have a Range Rover for going on holiday with the family. It, you know, it'd have this, it'd have that. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have a Range Rover SVR. I, I don't get it. Yeah. You know, if I want to go quick, I'll, I'll jump in my McLaren or my this, or I'll jump in my Mono if 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 I want the ultimate. You know, so you just just think of your think of your garage as a as a tool drawer, and you've got the right yeah. tool for the right job. Yeah, don't try I, and make one tool that does everything. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I found myself in a situation two years ago, year ago, where I had I had like five cars, but they were all very similar. And they were like slightly different, but they were all very similar. They were all sort of driver focused, sporty cars of various lights. And then I suddenly was sitting there, I think it was probably doing the podcast and asking people some of these questions and whatnot and being like, this is stupid. Like I should have a comfy car. Mm -hmm. I should have like, you know, one that is good for doing long distance, one that is not yeah. a track car. Like, yeah. And then so I've, I've since sort of diverged a little bit more and uh, gone away from that sort of everything must be hardcore driver, whatever, <laughs> the entire time, but have multiple. It doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, your point about the the Land Rover SVR, like the Range Rover SVR. I think of the companies, Land Rover does their SVR and crazy ones with the best ethos I, for, for the UK. Because you don't drive those cars and they're still soft, and like okay. comfy and all that. They've just got stupid engines in them. Okay. Whereas you go to the sort of German, like let's say uh, E63 estate, for example. I don't really know who's buying that car to go do a lap time, but it drive that car in the UK and they're, they used to be anyway, really stiff. Right. Which is not what you want in a comfy estate car. Right. I mean, you're right, and I've only ever been in SVR once, and 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 you're right. I've been in um, whatever the the M version of an X5 is. Yeah. And and I've you know I'm I'm a fairly hardcore car guy as you can imagine, but I sat in that and it was just tiresome how hard it yeah. felt. I mean, if I'd been sat in a McLaren or I'd been sat in a Lamborghini, then then you accept it. It's something you accept in exchange for something else that's good. Mm. But <laughs> there was. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm not having a go at anyone or any other product or any other company. It's just, yeah, I, I don't quite get it. Having said that, I'm going to go against everything I've ever, ever I've just said. I find the RS4 a fantastic all-round car. But you yeah. do accept that it's not going to be the track car that something else might be. It's not going to be the luxury car that someone else might be. But if I was a, you know, if I had to have one car to do everything, then that, that's pretty, you know, I can put my mountain bike in the back, I can pick up my parents from the airport, I can go on holiday with the family, I can go skiing, um, yep. I, I take, you know, go with another couple for a, a, a you know, nice dinner. It, it, there's enough refinement, there's enough comfort, there's enough sportiness, there's enough performance. It, it's a pretty good all-round car, but it doesn't pretend to be the best at any of them. And no. so if, you ha if that's all you can have, then I'd, you know, I'd recommend that. But if you can have a a Range Rover, a 720S and a Mono, then I'd recommend <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you're sorted. We've got a, the, all the bells going off in the background. I when, know, it's, um, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's Stuttgart for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It'll stop are in you, a second. Are you amongst all the manufacturers where you are? Um, yeah, I, I'm looking across the city here. I can just see Zuffenhausen, which is where Porsche is. Um, over to my right, um, I can just see uh, Unter Turkheim, which is where the um, Mercedes Museum and the Mercedes truck division is, yeah. um, and a lot of engineering's there. And then about 15, 20 minutes behind me is Sindelfingen, where I originally worked. That's where design is, that's where all the car production is, and that's where most of the car engineering is as well. So uh, we've got Bosch here, we've got Siemens here, uh, Marle is just a kilometer away um mm. it's 
it's car central that's for sure yeah yeah how come how come you were in germany because you live in germany don't you so i came in 96 uh, as a to do freelance design work for mercedes yeah. um and i loved it straight away i love the i love it, how it i love where it is what it looks like um it's great for my profession obviously as a freelance or you know automotive designer there's companies and uh, sorry car companies and car suppliers um there's tons of work um yeah. it's about six hours in a car to calais and about the same to monte carlo um you know an hour in any direction i can be in france switzerland austria um be in milan in two or three hours on a friday night traffic permitted yeah uh, so it's just a great part of the world I, I like you know I, I love mountains uh, so it's close to the alps black forest lovely roads um great weather it's um the weather's like uh, i mean we're level with bordeaux so you can imagine you know, mid yeah. mid france kind of weather it's just for me it's got it all it's great and um i felt comfortable here straight away i, I was uh, commuting back and to for about three months every Friday night back on a Monday yeah and after that I decided to get an apartment and uh, and start spending longer and longer time here so mm. and then are you so are you at BAC base like a lot or if it wasn't for COVID I'm there every second week so I do Monday yeah. to Friday at BAC and then I'm home for the weekend yeah. the following week I'll I'll, I'll work in Stuttgart another weekend at home and then back back to the uk so um yeah that's been my rhythm since about 2014 before that it was, mm. it was even more in the uk uh, yeah that's the irony i started off in the uk um commuting to germany and then i moved to <laughs> germany and started a company in the uk and do the same in reverse for my <laughs> sins so but yeah no, it's, it's, it, it's it seems like like where you said even just like location wise like where you are is access to so much stuff like i i love skiing yep. but being in in london and w liking skiing is is a problem because yeah. it's so far away um yeah, you yeah. can ski you so, can ski in the black forest an hour from here um i can cool. be in saint on saint anton in about two two and a half um of course saturday friday night or or sunday evening you know it's it's it, there's a lot of traffic jams and stuff so take mm. that with a pinch of salt but it's a it's another world compared to getting on a plane and flying to geneva and then you know a four hour yeah. transit and all the rest of it you know yeah are you designing outside of bac at the moment no no we're we're, 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 we're since within a month within a year or two of uh, 2011 um we've uh, focused exclusively on on bac um couple of things you know uh, potential collaborations but everything is 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 for for bac hmm. i normally wrap these up with five questions and everyone thinks i've heard these questions before and i haven't so i'm terrified now <laughs> do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey oh that's an easy one um atlantic road trip i did three thousand kilometers in mono uh started in copenhagen going all the way up the side of norway over the top and down back through sweden and finishing in stockholm um that was that was great because both neil and i we never get enough time in the car uh, you're always doing something else you know you go to events for test drives or you just you know, like donnington for example you know if yeah. i'd wanted to i could have jumped in the car but i don't like mixing the kind of the pleasure side yeah. With, with your responsibilities as a business owner side um I, I wouldn't do the latter very well and i wouldn't enjoy the former much um so it was great to just to just be in the car there was about 60 70 other cars and we were just driving 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 it was fantastic roads um it, it got a bit tiring at times i remember we set off one morning at eight o'clock in the morning and you literally just go up a mountain down the other side put your car on a ferry while you're on the ferry, you'll have a drink or something, go across the fjord, up the other side, down the other side, another ferry. And we're doing this all day long. And it's about 4.30 in the afternoon and I'm exhausted. Um, and I said to the guy who runs the event, AJ, I said, how far to the, uh, to the hotel? He says, oh yeah, this is the last ferry, don't worry. Other side, it's just a straight run to the hotel. I'm like, how far? He's like, four or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, got there at 11 o'clock at night. And as I got there at 11 o'clock at night, they took me to one side and said, oh, the, uh, the journalist from uh, whatever the newspaper was in Norway, he's been waiting to speak to you. So I sat down at 11 o'clock at night then to have an interview <laughs> for the, for the uh, Norwegian newspaper. So that was exhausting, but it was fantastic. Got some great images and some great memories from that.
Yeah, I, well, I, I, I was on there. I was in a, I was taking pictures and whatnot. And, and I think I remember seeing you driving this car. It just like every time you take your helmet off, you had a massive smile on your face. But I'd be like, I've just been sitting in a, in a Range Rover for five hours. And I'm, and I'm pretty bored. But like, you look, you look like you're having a lot of fun. But the, the only was... thing I would have changed that that car uh, that car had the standard carbon seat, which is fine. And to be honest, it, it fits me about as best as well as it could ever fit anyone um, for obvious reasons. But um, I've got, got, got a lot of customers who you know most customers take the made to measure one now, and I've got guys mm. oh my my Bentley makes my back ache or my Range Rover I get a bit of a crick in my neck or whatever. But with a ma molded made to measure seat, this I can just no limit. I can fall asleep in it you know, for, in the garage. I yeah. mean, it, 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 it's a massive difference. And I've really specialised in seat design over the years. But having one molded to you is, is massive. That's the only thing I would have changed for that whole trip. Um, if I'd have had that seat, um, then you really you can you can you could and I did stay in there all day. But um, that's the only thing I would have I would have altered. Yeah, seat seat design. It's an interesting one because I, like you said, I, I've I've been in Bentleys, whatever, like all sorts of stuff, and the comfiest car I've ever done a long journey in is my nine nine seven GT three RS. It yeah. has a fixed bucket with like for fabricy padding in it. Yep, and it's just for some reason that seating position. I can sit in it for days and I just, it's, it, I never get tired, my yeah. back never hurts, I never have a problem. Yeah, I mean, you're fortunate that that, that seat has, you know, suits you and suits your yeah. body. Um, and that is the feeling you get when, when it's when it's molded to you. It, it, also, it also reminds me of, you know, we talked about, um, you know, doing things in a different way if you have a fresh approach. I've done hundreds and hundreds of seats uh, over the years for other manufacturers. We did the, um, it was a 997 GT2 folding carbon seat. The first mm. time they did one with the airbag built in. And the target weight for that was 15 kilo because the standard 911 seat was between, I think, 23 and 26, depending on the um, yeah. on what was on it, which is a hell of a challenge to do because you're trying to create that weight saving but stay with the same concept. You know, if you've only got a two seat, uh, and, and they had to stay with that because that, car, that seat goes in the 911, it also went in the Boxster. Um, yeah. But if you're just designing a two-seat car, it's a much, much lighter solution to make the steering column and the pedals move, which the columns do anyway, and, yeah. and, and fix the seat than it is to make this. I mean, you think of the forces on a seat in an accident. And, the, you know, if you think about, you know, the impact up high with, you know, your upper body, your shoulders into a seat. Yeah. Uh, think of how cantilevered that is over the fixings to the floor. And yeah. if you could just support those shoulder areas. So... You know, in mono, for example, the seat weighs, I'm going to say, not even a kilogram. I mean, it's, it's, it's foam molded to you. There's, yeah. no, there's no structure. The structure is the car. So we just, you know, we mold the seat in the car to the driver. And, 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 then, and then you have an adjustable steering column and adjustable pedals. And that's a much lighter way of doing it. You keep the driver's eye line in the same place. You keep the driver's head position in the same place. Things that are important in an open cockpit, but they're important in most cars. So... Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of optimization that can happen with seats because you know even the best cars put 50 kilos worth of seat in the car, and there's, there'd be a simple saving there if they were to just alter the concept of, of how they do it, rather than take what they've already make and just apply yeah. as much tech into saving weight. Little aside yeah, there, that get... wasn't your question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because you get uh, like LaFerrari is a fixed seat. Yes. And pedals and steering move towards you. Um, I've, I've sat in one, but I've not, I've not driven one, so I can't say, say what that's like. But that as a process sounds, that sounds a lot better because I, I don't know about you, but I like my steering wheel really close. Yeah. Like annoy, everyone just gets in the car and they're like, what is this seating position? But I can basically get in no cars and have my seating, the position I want because I can't get the steering close yes. enough. Yes. Now, is that just because they, they've obviously just picked a certain length and they've gone, it's got to be within these parameters and making it longer is harder? Or have they picked an average person, I guess? It's, it's a good question, isn't it? I think um, the, the more you adjust, the, the longer the, the travel of the seat, the, the bigger the challenge to take the forces become, of course. You know, um, yeah. 
uh, the, the, the bigger any cantilevers or the bigger any kind of lever arms on the fixings are. As far as I'm aware, there's not many seats with anything more than the four fixings, you know, the two front slider fixings yeah. and the rear slider fixings. I don't know the LaFerrari well enough. I don't know if they've attached the, the shoulder areas, which makes a huge difference. The moment you just get hold of that area, you take an awful lot of force out of the, out of the, um, the fixings to the floor. Um, yeah, and so and so it's hard to get to get all of that all of that movement. And and again, um, yeah, they've had to take someone average and say, where's it likely that he's, he's going to want the steering wheel in these different positions? Whereas, yeah, um, if you just focus and say, I'm going to leave the person in the same place, you are going to have to have a bigger adjustment in your steering column. Of course, you are, um, and 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 adjustment in your pedals. But um, that's for us in a single seater. That's uh, easier to engineer our steering column just because you know it's in car direction all the way through the car. Mm. In the there's no real limit to how much you could adjust it, really, in theory. Um, I know when your steering column heads off in a different direction and tries to get you know in an offset seating position, yeah. then it gets more complicated. You're, you're adding extra elements to, to bring you to the point where you have that adjustable part, and that adjustable has to go yeah. forwards and backwards. So there's all kinds of kind of knock-on effects of the sitting off to one side and having the seat adjust on the floor and everything that, that make it harder and harder to to get what you want yeah and then like the you sort of your your seating angle you've picked that formula angle yep. basically that's one of the things about having let's say a fixed seat in yeah my gt3 i get in a car that's let's say it was another porsche and they have their 18 way seats yeah and you can adjust it 18 million ways um, and then us, someone from Lotus would say, make it adjustable, and they can adjust it wrong. But yes. I, if you don't know, because I don't know how to, in theory, set up a seat possibly correctly, because I would like it to be set almost like a reset like yes. button. You press reset, yeah. it puts it in the position it thinks is the best, yes. and then you adjust it from there, yes. rather than doing all of these things and putting yourself in a position that actually is probably completely wrong. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's other factors as well. I mean, um, you know, they'll crash test the cars with a certain at a certain seat angle, and that has to be okay, a compromise yeah. between you know the young the young uh, girl who's quite small and petite, and she likes to sit very upright and very close to the wheel, um, and and you know the the Italian perhaps who likes to sat yeah. seat lay flat and his arms out straight, but they have to pick a, a torso angle which is in which they're going to crash the car. And test and, uh, and calibrate all the airbags, okay. and so they've got it. You know, they, they've got to be able to go forward for the girl and back for the, for the you yeah. know, the macho. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> against Italian guys, sorry, chaps. Um, so yeah, that that's also a factor as well. They can't, they, you know, we've got one torso angle, yeah. and that's it. Uh, and that puts you puts your eyes. All we're effectively doing is moving the person up and down. I mean, okay. you might move them up and down and a little bit forwards and backwards, but you don't move them forwards and backwards by sitting them more upright. Upright, yeah. You know, um, so you do see when you look into a mono, if you look at the at the seat, you'll see how thick the top of the seat is between the structure and the, and the, and the actual backrest. Mm. That give you an idea of how big or small the person is. But we aim to put everyone's eye line and everyone's head in the same, in the same place in the car effectively. Okay, and what can you accommodate size-wise in people? We've got a customer in uh, in Holland. He's one ninety six. Um, I'm not sure what that is. That's tall. Um, that's, that's tall. tall. Um, that's another. That's the thing is is also is is it depends. I mean, I, I've got for my height. I'm six foot. For my height, I've got rel slightly shorter legs and a slightly longer torso. So I tend mm. to sit up higher. By the time I scoot down to get my head in the right place. Although my legs aren't the longest legs, they do, you know, they end up quite a bit further forward. You've got people the opposite way around, you know, long bod long legs and, and short body. So it's their height and then a combination of, of those factors, but um and of course how, how big they are as well. I mean a slim guy can, you know, can can, can get kind of crunched up, cinched up a little bit, get his knees yeah. up a bit. And, and you'd be surprised, a tall, slim guy, how big a guy you can fit in it. Um mm. but uh if anyone's interested, you should come and try and see. We'll see if we can fit. Yeah, in. yeah. <laughs> and does your when you're in the ideal position? I can't remember from when I was driving. How much is your head in the airflow? I mean, we're aiming to try and get your nose level with the top of the wheel. So you're right. looking just over the top of the wheel. Um, if you look directly in front of you and try and see the road, you probably look slightly through the aero screen. Um, but looking ahead of the distance, you'd normally be looking ahead, you know, um, of where the next corner is coming and stuff. You're, you're looking ever so yeah. slightly over the aeroscreen. 
So if you drive, you could drive it with a pair of sunglasses. Um, as a manufacturer, we can't recommend it in case someone got hurt, but you know, it'd be in the face or something. Um, but I've got lots of customers who do that, and it's and it's and it's lovely. I've done it, done it myself. It's you know, for people who drive, you know, mopeds or Harley's Davidsons with hope, open face helmets and sunglasses. It's you know, we know what it's like to get a, a wasp yeah. in the chin. Um, <laughs> but um, but but it, but it, you're a lot less exposed than you are on a bike. Um, same mm. same with the weather. Uh, you know, if you're on a bike, you need waterproof gear, and literally your whole body's being assaulted by the weather and by the cold. In mono, if you're driving mono in the rain, um, you might get a little bit on your shoulder. Uh, you'd put a helmet on in the rain, of course. Uh, but even then, you, you'll end up with wet hair, but you're not, get, you're not getting in your face, really, um, yeah. because of the, the angle you're down at and the aero screen kicking it up. It's not completely over your head. The top of your head does get some wind, and of course, you're aware. You'll do 100 mile an hour with a pair of sunglasses on. You're aware of the wind, of course, <laughs> but it is doable. Yeah, and do you put, um, do you put little aero flicks and stuff on the helmets? Yeah, um, the helmet I use is the bell helmet um, with the little duck bill as well. Yeah. So at the angle you're at, the duck bill sits quite nice and uh, it, it keeps it all uh, it keeps it all stable. It's uh, it's more it's less of a factor now with the uh, with the aero screen. Um, mm. Without the aero screen and the wrong helmet, you know, you could you could start to get a little bit of lift. But yeah. it was mostly, you know people using uh, motorbike helmets or whatever they had lying around yeah. a, a proper op- single seat helmet designed to be worn in an open cockpit with or without the air screen works absolutely fine yeah yeah yeah. that was a that was a, a, a real learning experience to when i when i got the radical yes. driving around doing like my first track day without i didn't have any of the aero bits on the helmet and you just like your head's getting ripped off <laughs> like, half the day and then you put all these little aero flicks and tails yeah. and whatever, and and it suddenly your head just sits level. You're like, yes. oh, this is so much better. Yeah, it's it's also an interesting point. And when we do test drives, I mean, if someone's comes from motorbikes, um, you know, he's got nice cars and mm. fast cars and everything, but but he, but he's a biker as well. They they come they come to terms with the open cockpit much quicker than guys who've never experienced 140 yeah. mile an hour wind down the <laughs> hangar straight. You know, uh, and that's why when we do test drives now we we give them like three or four runs in the car over the course of a day because that first run is, you know, is so overwhelming with all yeah. of this, all this information your body's receiving that it never got before. You know, no servo brakes, no power steering. Your body knows everything that's going on, but but it's a lot of noise, let's say, that your brain needs to learn what what do I filter out and what's important. So you know, any any little movement of the head is distracting if you've never experienced it before. Yeah. But, but once you're used to it, you don't even think about it. And and bikers feel comfortable in the car a lot quicker than guys who've only ever had closed cockpit cars. Yeah, I totally get that because it's like completely different yeah. experience. You're in the elements. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's you know, and that's what's wonderful about driving it at normal road speeds in a pair of sunglasses along a normal road. Um, mm. Every car is des- most cars are designed to insulate you to a certain extent from the speed, from the noise, from the whatever. But ultimately, if you just think about this, you know, this this bag of liquid and meat and <laughs> what a human being is, and then just moving through the world at, at 50, 60 mile an hour through forests at speeds that no horse or, or, or animal could move at. And we take it for kind of for granted. Whereas if you're an open to cockpit car, you go into the forest, you feel the air gets cool. Yeah. You smell the forest. That's why motorcyclists love it so much. And 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 you know, you come out of the forest and you climb up and, and, and suddenly the sun the sun's there and you feel the warmth against your body and, and, and as the speed builds, your hair starts getting pinned back. You're just aware of moving through the world and it's an experience which which we've kind of forgotten because modern cars are so good at doing what mm. they're designed to do that just doing 30 mile an hour to 60, 70 mile an hour on, on A and B roads is just, just a nice thing to do. You don't have to be going hell for leather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get so much more out. Like the only car I've driven like that recently, Caterham, you get a similar sort of vibes. So yeah, like you can appreciate everything. At, yeah. You're not just searching speed. Yes. Because that's the only thing you've got as a metric, like G-force. You've got all the other sensors and yes. whatever Absolutely. going on. If you could only drive one car for the rest of your life okay you get you technically get two you get one car and then you've got 500 pounds for something else so the the only one would be a, a mono r and, <laughs> and then i'd have an old diesel golf uh okay. for 500 quid yeah 
fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, because, because think? I tell you, uh, sorry, just just to clarify that, yeah. Because um, it's already started here in Stuttgart. They've got a system, uh, uh, um, a car sharing thing called Car to Go. Uh, okay. It's app based. They're all electric smarts. I don't actually own a car. I don't need a car. Really? Uh, no. Um, That's quite neat. I, I live in the city centre. I can walk uh, to anywhere I need to go to, or I can just get one of these cars. You jump in it. You pay twenty seven cents a minute. It's cheaper than the bus. Uh, for anywhere I need to go, yeah. I can park it anywhere for free, and I get one in the eve at the end of the day and drive home. And if I've had a I've had a drink or been out for dinner or whatever, um, I can call a cab. So, yeah. um, whilst that seems entirely impractical to only have a BC Mono and a diesel Golf, um, <laughs> I can I can do everything I need to do. I need to do, um, and I think that'll be the future. I think eventually when those smart cars can drive up and, and pull up outside your house, they'll already deliver it for you. Give them 24 hours notice and you say, I want a car to go to the yeah. airport at five o'clock on Monday morning. Uh, you tell them 24 hours in advance, it'll be outside fully charged, ready for you to go and it's reserved for you for two hours either side ah. of your planned time. So eventually that'll pull up um, and I'll jump in it and it'll drive me there while I catch up on email. So. I'm convinced that that's the future. And, uh, that so, is amazing. So, so just a BAC mono and a diesel Golf will do me. That is an amazing system because we have that to a little bit of a level in, in London with zip cars and stuff like that. But they're not that available, but you can park them wherever you like, which it completely removes in, in sort of city traveling times. You generally might be going for dinner or meet people, and you're like, well, I might want to have a drink. Exactly. And then you're stuck with a car, whereas you can or, then... Or, or, you, or you leave your car in town, and you've got to go and get it the next day. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the app, and that's the cars available close to me okay. right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean... That's crazy. That is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the future. And the ability to book them well in advance as well. Yeah. Because that's a worry. Exactly, and and the, and you know sometimes it's raining and the and the next one's you know four hundred meters away, so you know you go and get it and bring it back to the restaurant and the missus jumps in or whatever. But when they can drive themselves, they'll just pull up outside like you've got a chauffeur. That's the thing yeah. that people perhaps don't really fully appreciate. You know, if they think oh it's the end of motoring with autonomous cars, it's it, it's not. You know, the future of motoring will just be different. Like the horse, you know, horse's yeah. future became different, but the idea. An autonomous car is like a chauffeur, and, and everyone aspired to, you know, just be able to be driven, driven out to a nice <laughs> restaurant or to the opera yeah. or whatever, and then get picked up and taken home, and it's just waiting for you, and you have a drink or you have a chat in there. It's, it, it, it'll revolutionise everything, and, um, and and then if you're a kind of a person who see driving as a sport, then there'll be a whole new breed of cars which will which will fill the fill, fill that that void. Then, and I believe mono is is the beginning of that movement. Yeah. Because I, um, whenever I'm seeing it, it's, it's often like a family member or something and we'll go to visit and they'll be like, oh, Sam, do you want to drive? I'm like, no, I don't want to drive. Like, but you love cars and driving. I'm like, no, I love cars and I like driving cars in the right place at the right time in the right car. Yeah. I do not like just getting in some diesel SUV or whatever and driving for six hours. Like, yeah. no, I'd, I'd rather be... In the back. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Watching a movie. On my laptop or whatever, yeah. watching a movie or asleep exactly. or something. Yeah, I mean, autonomous autonomous cars and electric, let's be honest, electric cars are quieter. So, you know, effect, effectively, everyone's going to be like a wealthy Rolls Royce owner with a chauffeur. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's the hate about that? Use it when you want. You don't even have to own it. It doesn't have to sit in your garage and get your use out of it. You might not even own it. You just call it up on an app when you need it. And if you just want to go around the corner to see your mate, then you call, you call up a cheap one. It'll be a little two-seater smart that you jump yeah. in. But if you're going out for a nice dinner with your parents or something, then you'll, you'll call up an S-Class. You know, It gets cleaned after every time it's been used. It costs you a bit more, yeah. but that's it. So, um, yeah, what's not to like about that? Put fill yeah, your garage with Lancia Stratoses and BAC Monos. Ex exactly. Then you go back to just having a garage full exactly. of really hardcore driver's cars <laughs> and then everything else doesn't matter and you're not burning money on whatever. Yeah. A car that's yeah. sitting on your drive, not getting used. Right. What do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth more? The, the, the first thing that springs to mind as being undervalued, and this isn't in a monetary terms, but in a conceptual terms, is the i3. I think the i3 okay. is an incredible car. I think it's incredible today. I think it's been out six or seven years. I think it was way ahead of its time. And I'm glad it's working for BMW. 
in a way that the A2, which was also ahead of its time, mm. never did for, for Audi. I always, it always makes me sad when a company sticks its head, you know, they say in German that you lean out the window when you take a risk, you know. Yeah. So I, when a company takes a risk and don't get rewarded for it, it always makes me a bit sad, you know, um, yeah. be, because, because I wish the market would reward that a bit more. Instead of rewarding, you know, a, a, you know, a new Mini, which is a, just a lookalike of an old one with otherwise nothing to do with the concept. Bigger, or, or yeah. it's, it's just a big, I, I don't know, it's a... It's like a cartoon character applied to a car, you know. I don't yeah. know. It's, um, and and so um, I think the i3, the fact that they didn't just take a um, an ICE engined car and just electrify it, they started with a clean sheet. They looked at the best way of laying it out. They took advantage of that layout with a flat mm. floor, no transmission tunnel, putting all the systems further forward which means you got a very spacious dash layout a very innovative dash with just a couple of screens just floating in space recycle materials all that kind of thing in innovative doors in the city getting in and out great you know you, we can you can you can argue about whether you think it's a good looking car or not i have no issue with it actually but i accept that some people it's not their cup of tea but that's not what i'm talking about i just think it's such a you know i, I um my brother's got an i8 neil's got an i8 mm. and um it was being serviced and they gave him an i3 as the courtesy car and he asked me to go and pick it up he, he had to go away on uh, something yeah. to do with bac and i had the i i3 overnight and then i went the next morning and i and, and i took it around to, to our parents and i because my mum likes suvs because she sits up high so yeah. i gave her a drive in it and she's like i love this this is nice easy <laughs> to get in and out of good view all the rest of it dead quiet my dad loved it because it's just high tech and just sounds like a spaceship yeah. you know with its and so I, I think that those think the the the, the um, what's the word the um, the effect they'll have or the the, um, the I'm, I'm struggling to find the word the effect that they'll have and and the the foresight they have uh, or that type of that product has for the rest of the world and for the rest of car design I think is is underrated let's say that rather than undervalued. Yeah, because you look at an i3 now and it still seems you look at like the materials they used and the way they did it and the way they approached it. And you're like, oh, no, this is still like super current, but it came out ages ago. Exactly. Like, um, and <laughs> that and it started interesting. probably four or five years before that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love I want people to make I think this is why the electric car space at the moment is quite interesting from a design. I think design point of view is we've got a lot of people coming into the space that have not made, it's a bit like the boat thing we talked about at the very beginning, not made cars before. And they've thrown out all of this stuff that everyone's gone, this is what a car should be like, and gone, well, if it's electric, let's approach it from the start. And we're starting to see really interesting, I think, features and ways of making cars that you wouldn't have seen from your conventional manufacturer, or unlikely. No, I, I agree. I agree, and, and it can only be good because um, if, if if it's if if, it, if anything's in some way better, the market will reward that. Um, mm. Unless the market likes pastiche retro rubbish, <laughs> which it seems to, unfortunately, which but, it does. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but you would hope that the market would reward those things. It, it's the same in, in. I'm into mountain biking, but you know you've got mm. brands now in mountain biking um, from motocross. Um, okay. You know, uh, at the Eurobike, Panasonic had bikes, you know, mm -hmm. coming from the electronic side. <laughs> so now they've got something that's relevant. And so now they'll, you know, I think it's a ex super exciting time with, with, with the electrification um, and, and autonomous driving. I think it's a super exciting time. There's never been such a big revolution for automotive. Um, and coupling that with smartphones and all the, you know, um, knowing where we are, knowing where everybody is, Internet of Things. Um, yeah. it's a super exciting time. The, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Lots of, lots of cool stuff coming in, in all those spaces. And yeah, I, I still want, we want all the latest tech and stuff applied to driver's cars. And I want manufacturers to just keep banging down that route of like, let's make driver's cars and then accept that not everything needs to be a driver's car. You know, you've got horses for courses and whatnot and, um, keep going down that rather than we've seemed to have the last couple of years with let's say supercars or whatever have just got heavier and faster 
or not even necessarily faster, just like heavier and more power. And it's the power number, power number, power number. And you drive the stuff and you're like, eh, it's not that fun. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we collectively have to accept mm. a little responsibility for that because I think if the new GT3 Porsche came out uh, whenever it does and it was less powerful than the old one, I think we all know what everyone would be up in arms about. Um, I if mean, you, was... and I, you and I, maybe not. Um, <laughs> if it was lighter. Yeah, well, I'd prefer that. that. I'd prefer that. And I think the purists would probably say the same thing. I know the guys who um, who, who still find the, the original 996 GT3 their favourite of the GT3 yeah. cars, they, they, they'd recognise that. Um, World Rally cars have had electronic diffs, so these are mechanical diffs which you can adjust electronically. Uh, Formula yeah. One's got electronic diffs, no one criticises that. Well, two electric motors, one to each rear wheel, gives you an, the, the, the world's most infinitely, infinitely adjustable, um, yeah. sky's the limit, electronic diff. So there's no reason why this new technology can't make driver's cars even better driver's cars. It doesn't have to be applied to you know, giving them a silly range or, 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 or doing, let's be honest, what, what, what most cars are for, which is transport. Um, yeah. so, so it's clear, it's obvious that that's the way that, that it's always applied because for 99% of the people and 99% of the time, and even for you and I, transport is transport. Um, yeah. but it is absolutely possible to take the new technology and, uh, and apply it in ways that make our drivers cars better. And I'm convinced that the future is electric motors driving our driven wheels. I think the big question mark is, is the electric motor getting its battery, uh, power from a battery? Is it getting it from a fuel cell? Is it getting it from a little gas turbine that's running on yeah. ethanol? Is it getting it from an induction strip built into the highway? You know, are we having laser beams from satellites in space <laughs> putting the power into the vehicle? I mean, that's all still to be decided. So when people say, oh, yeah. you sure electric cars are the future, you know, the, the batteries are too heavy or whatever, Electric car doesn't necessarily mean battery. It can mean all kinds of things, but I'm convinced that the internal combustion engine will eventually get replaced by the simplicity and elegance of an electric motor. Yeah, yeah, a motor on one on each wheel is- For example. A, an in incredibly elegant way of, and simple solution to moving something. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's very efficient, yes. which unfortunately, IC engines are not so yes. much. Exactly. Uh, but then it's the power source. Yes. That's, the, that's exactly. the problem. Exactly. And so and something will happen and it won't necessarily be the the best or the most efficient that will win. You know, you remember I don't know if you're old enough, Sam, but do you remember VHS and Betamax video? I, I remember VHS. Yeah. I don't remember the battle. You're right, there you go. So so Sony wouldn't wouldn't let anyone else use their technology, I think, or unless they paid, whereas Panasonic yeah. it was almost like uh, well it was free. Um, and so VHS won, although technically Betamax was a, was a technically better system. And so yeah. you could argue that fuel cells aren't as efficient uh, from an energy com conversion point of view because you're converting the energy more often in the, in the chain than you are if you just produce sustainable electricity yeah. somehow. Instead of making you know, a hydrogen with it, you just put it in a battery. That's it, you're done. Next time I, next time I convert it, I'm using it. So you can make that argument but we all know what the problems are with with um, with with the weight of batteries and then charging times and, and and facilities to charge. You know, if Shell and BP got together tomorrow and said you're going to be able to tank hydrogen at every gas station in the UK by the end of the year, well then the battle's over. You know, yeah. straight away that's it. Fuel cell. We, we've lived with 25% efficiency for 100 years. You know, I think we've managed with 60 or 70% for for the next hundred. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, not yeah. an advocate necessarily of that way. I'm just saying that's that's for me the bit that's not been decided yet. The bit that has been has been decided is is electric motor for me. Yeah, yeah, and and there'll be there's space for each of these. Like yes. in your whether it's a small city cars that are being remotely controlled and they drive around and they pick you up and then they go and park themselves and they charge back up again. Electric works very well. Yes, exactly. For your your truck that needs to just do whatever it is, 1500 miles, and then refill in not very long and then do the same yeah. again. Hydrogen is a better, exactly. is a better solution. Yeah. And, and these, right. and, and these and, sorry, just finally on that point, and, and these new sustainable fuels, I know Porsche working mm. hard on that. And, you know, that might be the way that our um, cars like Mono, classic cars, um, Maybe that's the way that they can still have internal combustion engines where 
I'm not trying to get the most efficiency because I'm not trying to go the furthest I can on every drop of yeah. energy. I'm after an experience. I mean, what's efficient about skiing? You know, these huge yeah. machines that just take people up the top of a hill to slide back down. You know, so you don't always have to make the efficiency or the, you know, uh, those kinds of arguments. I think um, it's absolutely okay to say, I'm doing this for the fun of doing it. And it's more fun if I've got an internal combustion engine. I accept yeah. that I don't want to, you know, I want to minimize my impact on the planet. And if I can do it in a sustainable way, then fine. So if I end up with some kind of sustainable, you know, green fuel that goes through my 342 horsepower four cylinder, then then fine. I won't enjoy it any less for that. I'll enjoy it more, yeah. probably. I think that's that's the and that solution, if they can get it to work reasonably well and cost effectively. Great. I, like, I think this is that's going to save us sort of petrol heads. But it also helps the legacy fleet issue yes. with all of this tech. Like at the moment, it's all super expensive and only the richest people or whatever are buying it each year. And it's going to take 50 years to clear the, the legacy fleet from burning CO2 and whatnot. So if we can come up with a renewable fuel that will that most of these cars can easily run on without maybe just running them on ethanol and destroying all of the piping and whatnot and yes. stuff like that, then it, that could, that's a very significant part of the situation. Absolutely. And, and, you know, people talk about how, how is a, how is a, you know, a classic car or, or, or a car that's let's say focused just on driving gonna, and is, and is, and is human controlled. How's it going to interact with all these autonomous vehicles? Well, <laughs> well, maybe it's just a little black box and you put it into your Jaguar E-Type and all it's just doing is just reporting to the Internet of Things that every other, un, every other autonomous car around it understands, you know, and, and the moment you touch the brake pedal, it just reports that you're braking and the force at which you're braking. So all the, all the cars around you are aware of it. I don't see any reason why that that couldn't that couldn't work. No, and I, d I think I think we're sort of we've got enough sort of like history sort of in the country where I think we'll let people hopefully for a long time drive their old car. But if you've got a classic car in that scenario and it's not a let, like intelligent, you can probably drive anywhere and everything will just get out of the way. <laughs> well, I, I mean, now I'm thinking about it. I mean, we're all autonomous. <laughs> Yeah, and we drive around in a world of autonomous humans. I have no idea what the guy's going to do in front. No, you know, the first I know that he's braking is when he's pressed the pedal and the lights come on. Then I have to react to that. Then I've got to lift my leg off the gas and I've got to start braking. Well, a, a, an autonomous car could do that quicker. It'll report the moment he touches the brake pedal before the vehicle's even actually started to decelerate. And at the speed of light, the car behind will know. So I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be still be safer. You know than hundreds and thousands of millions of individuals doing whatever yeah. they want where no one has a clue what they're going to do. We just make kind of educated assessments based on our experience of driving on the road. Yeah. It's like, oh, the body language of that car, you know, I'm in the fast lane, I'm doing 150 on an autobahn and that car's wandering out and he's coming yeah. up behind a truck. I think he might come into my lane, so I'll slow down. So we're doing all that all the time. So um, I, I don't see that as being a, being a, being a, big, a big problem. Yeah. It's totally possible. I think one thing that humans sort of underappreciate or the, in this sort of autonomous thing is, is how good we are yeah. at picking up Agreed. all of this information. Like we are so much better exactly. than a car at the moment. Like yeah, by exactly. You know, I mean, there was the famous one with the, you know, autonomous cars being fooled by a bicycle that's on the back of a car being transported, <laughs> yeah. thinking it's a bicycle that's about to come into their lane. Things like that. That's when you realise, you know, we're in awe of how sophisticated these systems are and they will get there. There's no question about that. Oh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, you, you do forget how good we are at assessing it's, our world and understanding our world. And it's those things, those really small things. I'm endlessly surprised about, like, driving down the road and you just you look at a car and you go something off with that car yep. it's just driving down the road be like yep. mm. and then three minutes later it does an erratic mover yes. maneuver without exactly. indicating or whatever and you're exactly. like i don't know what i could have what i picked up on yeah but it's deep in there and yeah. i knew to watch out the, the, the car's movements like I, I like i said I, I call it the body language of the car yeah um and you get good at you get good at assessing that. Um, I mean, I, 
my uh, my wife uh, Yasna's got a, a, a relatively base model BMW, and I was driving up a up a road in the city, and someone stepped to a pedestrian crossing. Now they just hit the button, you know, to, to change the crossing, yeah. and just took a step forward. Well, the car slams on the brakes, and a little red person symbol appears. You know, it's 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 impressive technology, and I think that's the in a year she's had it. That's the only time it's ever, let's say mistakenly worn yeah. and, and there's a couple of other times when it's it's been correct um but i wasn't even close to thinking that person was going to step out i just saw them hit the button yeah i know they're going to wait for the green man before they walk out so it's um yeah you're right we, we underrate how, how 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 clever we are or how well adapted we are to our world yeah there's a time though and actually doing the the atlantic road trip that sort of area reminds me i did a trip in sweden and we i was in a bentley continental v8 that had the thermal camera and so at night time we're not that good no. at picking this stuff we're pretty good but this there was a lot of um like animals and stuff yes. that would just, just run out of the trees and the thermal cameras will pick up stuff you cannot see and if you're driving around town it would pick up people behind cars that you can't see and highlights it on a display and then that gave me a lot more confidence driving down those roads because you're Absolutely. not the entire time worried about something yeah. just coming out i mean i definitely think you know on one if you if you if you imagine that autonomous cars are let's say replacing the person in control uh, was what you just described it's talking about augmenting yes. the senses of the person in control um I'm in favor of both of these things. I think they're both the future, but uh, but I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, head up displays or, you know, either in your screen mm. or, you know, maybe one day in your helmet um, that warn you, you know, you, know, you, you get the, you know, get your warning on your iPhone, you know, debris in the road um, or obstruction ahead or something yeah. like that. Well, you know, with the internet of things and most cars will be autonomous, they've all got LIDAR, they're all scanning the road. You know, the first one that goes past that carcass of a truck tire that's lying in yeah. the middle lane, uh, it's straight away loaded up and that appears in my display telling yeah. me, you know, that I can see the triangle, I'm two kilometers away and I can see the little arrow pointing yeah. to where it's going to be. It's, um, the future's super exciting. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. And one that I thought about, I don't know what, it's sort of connected, but we can see where it's going to go, is um, I think it was the new Evoke whenever I saw that. And it was the first car I'd seen that had a camera for a rear view, but only when you want it. And I was like, oh, that seems stupid. And they're like, yeah, but if you fill the boot full of luggage, yeah. you can't see out the back. And I was like, yeah. actually, there are so many cars I've driven that you can't see out the back. Yes. And then where does that then go yep. there's so many cars that you can't see out the side yep. but like you said you you wear glasses so you could be wearing glasses and that could allow you to see through the car exactly <laughs> well i mean uh, i don't know if it's a rumor or if it's been published yet but but i've heard um you know modern jets in the head-up display if they look down they don't see their legs they, they see, see the down. view as if they're not there i think um, that exists yeah i, I do too and I've, I've 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 seen in various places or for various functions tech which makes makes me believe that that's 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 actually not that not not, not that difficult yeah. to achieve but yeah imagine that you're wearing a pair of glasses or sunglasses or whatever it's got all of your information it's like a head-up display and wherever i look around the car it's like the car doesn't exist you know i can yeah. i can literally see everything and, and then you can even start to play around with well what do i want to see i remember years and years ago when lotus developed the noise cancelling um stuff and they had an esprit um and they, they were capable of getting rid of all of the sound and you're driving yeah. along and the, it was just like a hiss he said well that's not much fun though is it so it can decide to filter out the noise you don't want to hear but let you hear the engine so now you yeah. hear the engine with none of the harshness of the road and all this kind of thing so you could start to say well there's things i want to see like how hard my engines work and see my exhaust started to turn yeah, red yeah. you know um but I want to be able to look over my shoulder and have an unobstructed view before I, I before I turn in to a corner or something. Yeah, so, yeah, no, super yeah. exciting, all that. It's, it's cool. What is the most interesting car to you at the moment? <sighs> Nothing springs to mind. I, <laughs> I, 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 I suppose the most interesting things that, that I find and the things I admire most are some of the things that Elon Musk's doing with, with Tesla. Mm. I have to say, I, I'm not, not a great fan of the design of the cars, and I'm or, or inside or out. Um, but this completely fresh approach and the way that they 
update software and run things in ghost mode in parallel and, and, and learn yeah. with machine learning, all that. But I, I, I don't want to sound like an old fudder, but I don't <laughs> know, just, just every car's more powerful and heavier than the last. It just feels like we're going in the wrong direction. I, I even feel like to a certain extent, you know, electric cars are, are going in the wrong direction. I remember when I first started at Mercedes, I think the S class was just over two tons. Mm. I remember chatting with the with the engineers and they were putting more and more stuff in and and I said, Well, you know, that let's say you're a hundred we're not hundred kilos, but let's say just for easy numbers, you're a hundred kilo person. Um, you know, you you're five percent of the weight of that t two ton car and we're only getting twenty five percent of the energy we release from our fuel because of all the inefficiency of the machine. So, you know, the energy required to move me from A to B is like one point two five percent of the energy yeah. That, we're, that we're that we're using and that just doesn't seem sensible in any world whether whether it's a polluting t technology or not um and the idea you know the ca electric cars are getting heavier and heavier because there's such a focus on range and i get that i mean your range anxiety is probably and the charging it while you're in your journey they're probably the mm. two biggest obstacles right now um but it just means you've got i don't know what a tight what does a tight can weigh two and a half two point Four, right? Something like that, yeah. With a fifty-five kilogram, <laughs> yeah, housewife taking a five-year-old to school in it. It's just, even if it's clean technology, it's it seems crazy. And you've got to make that battery for the. It's you know a little bit like the guy who went goes to work in an estate car all all year round because once mm. a year he needs to put the wife and kids in and go on holiday. You yeah. know, if, if the modern world should be. Well, and it will be different, you know. He'll he'll go in a two seat smart to work, and and yeah. and and he'll and he'll he'll order up a, a big car for, for the holiday. So I think that is the right direction. But lugging around two point four tons of car, I think it's a nine hundred kilogram battery or something. Lugging yeah. that around most of the time for the just so you don't worry about the one or two times you go on a long journey that you can make the journey. Yeah, just just doesn't seem sustainable. And so when you say what do what do I find the most interesting? I find myself thinking I'm, I'm just disappointed in, I, I admire the technological solutions that all these yeah. companies come up with, but from conceptually, it just seems like we're, we're going in slightly the wrong direction with our sports cars and, and with our, with our regular cars, there's still too big a focus on, on, on not the right things I, I feel, but I mean, you know, what do I know? Like I say, I mean, a successful product, the mini, I, you know, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I, never, no, it, I, I never will, but the majority do. So, you know, I, what the hell I do don't I know? think they do as much as they used to. I think the mini, this, when the sort of mini came back out again, whenever that was, 2006 or five or somewhere, um, it was small ish. And everyone loved it for being small. And then there was this sort of feedback loop. Like, well, what would you like from the next Mini? And they're like, oh, well, I'd like to be able to, when I go on long journeys, put more luggage in it. And like, okay, let's make it a bit bigger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's massive. Whereas now you look at it and it's not a small car. So you're not buying it because it's a small car. It's just a car. So people buy Fiat 500s, which is still a small car. And they sell a lot of Fiat 500s. I think they would sell more Minis if the Mini, maybe you can have two cars or whatever, a big yeah. one and a small one, but still have a Mini Mini. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, uh, and I accept why they did it and they've done it, they've, they're a business and they've done it because they, you know, they need to be a, a sustainable business and it needs to work. But I don't know if you remember, way before um, we actually had the Mini, um, they were experimenting with various concepts for what the next Mini or what the new Mini could be. And there was a series of concepts called Spirit. Do you remember them? Um, they, it's a long, long time ago. I yeah. think there was a four seat version and a two seat version. Um, they didn't look like minis, but they were mini in spirit in concept. Uh, yeah. it's a long time since I've seen them. So my memory might be playing tricks on me, trying to make a round hole fit in a square peg or whatever, all the way around. Um, but, um, I'd have admired that more and say, what, what was revolution about the Mini? And it was great packaging and it was a, at a price that everyone could afford so movie stars could show up at a movie and, it, yeah. and, and, and a 17-year-old and a, you know, could take a driving license in it. But I accept that people wouldn't have... Um, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's, that's probably got more in, 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 more in, in common with a smart car um, yeah. than it has with looking like a Mini. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I accept the reasons why they did it, but but I I wish we were lived in a world where that that approach was rewarded, that 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 innovation, um, and that that approach. yeah 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 that approach yeah that approach. The, have you seen the Citroen? Is it the Citroen Mi? And there's another one. There's a Renault something. They sure. are. Um, I think it's the Mi Citroen Me. Amy, Amy. Uh, That's the one. Yes, I know uh, that car. Yeah, it. I, I, you know, it's uh, it's visually challenging. I know, but it's, oh, it's a cool concept, though. It's a cool concept, exactly. And uh, the idea of uh, the doors being the same door on each side. Yeah, they're the, the front... approach. They're the approaches I admire. I like, and I would drive that. And I think, you know, if that if that turned up autonomous and you jumped in it, just just you and your girlfriend, and went down to the pub, and then it headed off to pick someone else up. Fantastic. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? And um, instead of this looks a little bit like a car that was cool in the 60s, but has, yeah, otherwise yeah. has nothing else to do with it. Yeah. Sorry I to think... go on. Anyone who's got a Mini, I'm not, I'm not bashing. <laughs> it's just a great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's in, and I, this sort of ties into something else that I've, I've sort of banged on about for a while. But that, that concept I love because I absolutely go, why am I driving around? a massive car day to day if I don't have much stuff. And we have a Peugeot E208 that we use around town. And that is actually still too big for day to day in most of the sense. Yeah. But we have this problem in the sort of luxury car market where luxury cars are big cars. And if you want the nicest car a company makes, it's the biggest car they yes. make. Yes. I agree. Uh, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think, I mean, these electric smart cars here, one of the fun, it, it, it completely frees you from any uh, parking anxiety. Firstly, mm. because you park anywhere for free. And secondly, you can park at 90 degrees to all the other cars that are parallel parked. Yeah. So you're just backing up to the curb in a space that nothing else could fit in. You can fit it in a space that even it couldn't parallel park in. And just, <laughs> just yeah. there's always somewhere to park. And the great thing is, is even if you park it somewhere, maybe you shouldn't, it's gone five minutes later anyway. Um, yeah. So, um, but I agree, I agree with that. I think, I think Smart tried to, I think, I think they started with a really interesting, they were called a micro car company originally. I don't know if you remember that far back. They were called a micro car no. company and their product was a Smart and they've now become Smart. Um, it's a challenge we oh, yeah, had. Because that's their logo, isn't it? It was like a little MC, micro M- car. MCC was the car yeah. company and Smart was their first product. But as a lot of my colleagues in marketing told me, if you've only got one product, you, 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 you become, your product becomes your brand. Yeah. And that's, that's something we've worked hard at, you know, with, with, with uh, BAC to make mm. it you know, clear, this is the brand and this is the product. Because then that opens the door that we can do almost anything in the future. If our brand yeah. became mono, then that kind of closes some doors for us. Anyway, that was a little aside. But uh, mm. the original idea was that the, um, it had this, you know, the silver kind of, whatever this tritium or whatever it's called cell which was meant to be safe and then these plastic clip-on body panels and the idea was you could have a black one which the guy you know the dad in his suit runs to work in um, and on the weekend the girl puts some pink ones on with some you know <laughs> i don't know hello kitty or whatever i'm exaggerating yeah. of course but uh, she clips them on and then it's and it's her little run around you know so that was the That's idea, idea. Yeah. Um, but you're right there's an element of prestige i must admit if you see somebody here in stuttgart in a smart car you don't automatically think he can't afford the bigger one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you would if you saw him in a Cayman. You'd probably mm. think if he could, he'd rather have a 911. Yeah. You know, if he's in an E-Class, he'd rather have an S-Class if he could. Um, smart has, has, has slightly, slightly gone around that because it's such a practical thing um, that anyone who's sensible about how you use a car in a city knows it's the, a great way it's, of getting around. a great solution, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, and I would just like, I would like manufacturers to flip it a little bit and go, you can buy the smallest car with the luxury elements of the biggest car. Yeah. So like the comfiest interior, whatever, but in the smallest package. Like a, a it's why cars like a, a Audi RS3, they sell loads of them because people are like, I want an A3, but I want the one with the nicest stuff. And yeah, it's got a better sounding engine and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like... They sell the sort of the most expensive version of the smallest car, whereas actually they probably sell nowhere near as many 
RS like a fours in that sense RS fours. Yeah. Because it's not the smallest one, yes. and then they still sell the big one. Yes. Whereas that middle one, people are going like, oh, it's 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 a sort of different group of people. Yeah, yeah. The small ones, for the reason of it being small, and the big ones, the best in inverted yeah. commas, and the middle one, it's like, could you not afford yeah. the RS six? So you got enough. Yeah. But, but I, I, I've been in both. I find the RS six way too big. But I, I, I'm the guy. Who, or one of the guys who created mono so i like small i like efficient i like lightweight so i admire the rs4 the rs6 for me was just a, a bit of a tank it lost its uh, it lost its ability to be so sporty it's, it become basically an autobahn basher mm. which is I, what they used over here i love the rs4 i i prefer the rs4 I, to the rs6 I do. mainly because of size and weight yeah me too um and in the uk it makes it like just having that bit less width Yes. Makes a massive difference. Right. Final car. Final question. Five car garage. Unlimited value. Right. Well, I want a, I want a, I want a comfy car for going away with the family. And it's also going to yep. be able to tow a mono in a trailer. So that'd be something like, I like the Velar. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have a, a mono R, of course. Um, mm -hmm. I'd have uh, an i3. Um I was at Salon Privé and I fell in love with uh, the Aero GT from Eagle. If I'm going to have a classic oh, car, yeah. you know, because ultimately your classic car is never going to be the performance of a modern car. So no. I don't need it to be, you know, the most extreme classic car it can be. It might be that or it might be something like an Espada. Mm -hmm. 4C, stylish, cool, a little bit sporty, you know, but not, not going to win any, break any records. Yeah. And probably something like you know, Series 2 uh, Land Rover or something uh, with a soft top with the sides rolled up. So Yeah. Um, and try and tick all the bases with, with, with that yeah, five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that really That's... was spontaneous. I'm going to kick myself out. <laughs> Why do you say the McLaren F1? Why do you say this? Sergio, uh, the, the, pin and, the Pin and Freena Sergio concept car, you know, that I, I could, you know, with yeah. proper consideration, I could go, I, I could do some really uh, slick sounding uh, choices for some slick sounding reasons, but that was literally just... <laughs> From the no, it's, I think it's good. And I, I like how sort of real that is. Someone asked me the other day, and in my five-car ultimate garage, I had a small electric car. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I can't believe I'm even saying this, but no, absolutely. If you said to me, you've only got five cars, I'm always having a small electric car. Yes, now. yeah. Like, did I say i3? Uh, I said i3, didn't I? You did say i3, yeah. yeah. exactly. That'd be, and, and I know it's not as easy to park as a smart. I'll take, I'll take that for the fact that I find it um in in lots of ways just an even more compelling thing um yeah. i'll accept that it isn't quite as easy to park as the two c smart and I, i'm in a family of three so um yeah you know yeah you need a bit more space cool well thanks very much for coming on the podcast it's been a pleasure